This is Evolutionary Radio. This is your host, Trevor Karitz, and I got another really good guest lined up for you guys. Joining me on tonight's episode is IFBB Pro, Paulo the Freak Almeida. Paulo, welcome to the show. Hey, Trevor. How's it going? Thanks for having me on, man. I want to get on another good Canadian bodybuilder just to show people that there's more coming out of Canada than poutine and maple syrup. (laughs) Yeah, there sure is. Yeah, I just had on Antoine Vallant. He looked really good at the Toronto Pro. He did. It's really good to see him back at it. And, uh, yeah, he really looked phenomenal. They really brought an awesome package. I'm, I'm really proud of the guy. Yeah, he, uh, he went through a rough couple of years, but I'm glad to see he's, uh, he's doing well now. Yeah, he's uh, really good for the sport, especially being also Canadian as well. So, Paulo, one of the reasons I want to get you on the show is because you only really got serious into bodybuilding when you were about 34. Is, is that correct? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So how the heck did you get so big so quick? Well, like I always like to joke with people, you know, I, I picked the right parents. Uh, um, obviously, you know, genetics, you know, playing a huge uh, role in this sport, as you know, uh, like as in any sport, but obviously, like I tell people, you always obviously have to put in the work. I just find you know, that it comes easier with having good genetics. And, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it, you know. And, and I've, one thing that's always been there from the start is, you know, my, my training intensity, which, you know, I uh, owe a lot to, to my fast success and my fast growing is uh, always pushing myself in the gym. Every, every session I've been in, the, always, always in there, always wanting to, you know, get one more rep or 10 more pounds or whatever the case may be and just always pushing myself each and every time. And I just found that I grew so fast with that combined with great genetics. So what did your training look like to put on so much size so quick? Were you training twice a day? How many days per week? What Were you doing a split? Were you doing like upper body, lower body? What did it look like? Uh, when I first got back into it, I was only training four days a week, uh, probably for the first year or two. Um, it would basically be uh, chest and triceps, back biceps, and then shoulders, traps, forearms, and then leg day. So it would only be four days a week. And then uh, as I got more accustomed to it, and then I hooked up with my first trainer, who was actually a pro, about two years later, got me into training uh, body parts uh, twice a week. And I've pretty much been doing that ever since. And uh, I'm a huge believer in that. And I believe that anybody that's been training for at least a good certain amount of time uh, should be doing that as long as nutrition and, and, and uh, recovery is set up properly, I don't see there's no reason why everybody should be doing that. And I'm a big believer in that. And uh, like I always tell people, you know, what do you think you're going to grow more out of, you know, training a body part, say, once a week, which is four times a month, or twice a week, which is eight times a month. You're getting double the kind of the growth, growth spurts, uh, the growth cycle. So you're going to grow big. Like I said, as long as you're split, is set up properly so you're recovering in between those sessions and your nutrition and your rest is set up accordingly did it take a lot of food for you to gain that size or are you someone who can grow on not not too many calories i actually grow on very little calories uh, people always assume that that i eat so much and i take in so much and honestly I, I really don't even at my height when i got up to about 320 last year um, you know, my max carb days were probably up to maybe 450. So, and for a guy who's over 300 pounds training as hard as I do, as intensely as I do, that's really not that much. You know, there's guys that are taking almost probably double that. And also, you know, on my off days, I would really slash my carb down very low. I do mostly protein fats and, and more lower carbs which I found was helping keeping my insulin sensitivity. So when I did have those, my carb days, all my training days, I would utilize that better. But honestly, yeah, not, uh, not a lot of food at all. That, that comes down to genetics. But, you know, having the opposite side of, uh, side of that, when it comes to getting, dieting down and, and getting conditioned, it takes a lot more for me to get, get into that contest shape, uh, uh, opposite of some guys. Interesting. Did you train today, Paula? Uh, no, actually, today is a day off. 
Okay, so then let's say yesterday. Um, give us give us an example of like what a typical day in the life looks for you meal wise, because I'm sure our listeners would love to know what someone as big as you actually eats. Well, right now, like uh, uh, you know, I'm not crazy into competitive. I'm not I'm not in like my body bu- slash bodybuilder mode anymore. Um, you know, so I'm pretty much just doing my own thing. Uh, basically morning would be, you know, I wake up in the morning. I do about 30 minutes cardio right now, as of right now, anyways, uh, 30 minutes of cardio. Then I, you know, right now I'm actually implementing fasting as well for health purposes. And just, I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to downsize and drop some weight. So then I would do some cardio and then I wouldn't eat for about a couple hours later. So I'd give me about a rough, roughly 16 hour fast. Then I'd, my first meal would probably be, a, I'd have a shake, uh, with, uh, some, uh, throwing some walnuts in there. And then I'll probably train two hours later. Um, I still like having my intro, my intro workout shake, which I've been doing for the last five years. I'm a, also a big believer of that as well. Um, you know, just a little bit of carbs, maybe 35 grams of carbs with some EAs, some creatine and some glutamine. And then, uh, yeah, and then so train for about an hour and a half. And then uh, probably about an hour and a half later after that, I'd have a meal, nothing too crazy. Um, maybe some carbs maybe not maybe just a salad like i said right now i'm trying to i'm i'm trying to drop some weight i want to downsize a bit and uh, doing a bit of a recomp and and stuff like that too but in my prime it would probably be a little bit different than that um i wasn't doing too much cardio in the off season so it basically be wake up i'd probably have some oatmeal with some whey protein and then uh, two hours two and a half hours later three hours i'd have probably uh uh, car, uh, carton of egg whites with maybe two slices of like uh, 20 grain toast and then again three hours after that i would do an, uh, the oatmeal again uh, with some uh, isolate in there that's about an hour and a half to two hours pre-workout and then during my pre uh, my workout again some more intra workout carbs and then post-workout i'd have a meal containing some carbs and then bedtime i'd probably have a salad um Bedtime, I'd, I'd never, I'd never like to have carbs before bed. I always used to have just protein, fats, so I'd have like a salad before bed. Have you always been doing the intro workout, amino acid, and carb drinks? Yeah, I've been I, not always. I've been doing that probably for the last five, six years. For the two years, I, I didn't. Actually, my nutrition wasn't that great. Uh, uh, but uh, when I did hook up with uh, IP Pro, actually, a meat appear. He uh, got me into doing the, the, the split where you're training body parts twice a week and using the intro workout carbs. He had gotten that from John Meadows, as I'm sure you know who he is, and he's a big uh, proponent of that. Uh, so I've been pretty much doing that ever since then. So for the last five, six years, uh, I'm a huge believer of it. I think that's the best time to flush, flush the muscles with those type of nutrients, uh, as long as you're using the proper stuff. Um, proper nutrients and, and like essential amino acids and carbs. I think that's the best time to start it. It'll, it'll speed up the recovery. Uh, you know, the, the old method was wait till after the workout, have your post workout shake. But, you know, his whole thing was why wait till after while when you can start repairing the, the, the tissue right off the bat and feeding the muscle. Basically, when you're working out, you're actually doing, a, you're actually creating a catabolic. You're, uh, you're doing something that's catabolic. You're actually, breaking down muscle tissue uh, and but it, it gives you an opportunity for an adult it gives you an anabolic opportunity so we take advantage of that by having that drink and you know creating the muscle protein synthesis at the same time while we're doing that so it's actually milo sarkev who started all that and i know he was a big big component of insulin are you using insulin before your workouts or are you just stick into the amino acids and carb powder uh, back back more when I was uh, uh, more competitive the last year or two, um, just until recently I haven't been. But up to that point, yeah, for the five years prior to that I was. Only a little bit, uh, of maybe 10 I use insulin uh, with those carbs and everything to help shut out the nutrients. Um, you don't need a lot. The guys to nowadays use way too much. There's no need for that. Um, and, but, yeah, I would do that. Just on, so basically just on training days pre-workout and then I have my, my, my intro workout shakes during my workload to, to feed me. And then basically the insulin would help shuttle the nutrients uh, into the muscle cells uh, during that time. So I'm guessing you probably use like a short acting form of insulin, like uh, Humalog, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Humalog. Yeah. In and out of the system fast. That's what I like. 
Uh, so would, you, much, would you take please. that with your pre-workout meal or would you take it right before you start your workout and then you drink your intra workout shake? No, I would do that about 15 minutes before I started my workout. And then, I, and uh, so basically like before I left home, I would, I, I would uh, you know, pin myself with the insulin. Um, and then that's about 15 minutes before I hit the gym on my way to the gym. I would already start drinking my drink, start getting that into the system so basically, by the time I got to the gym, the insulin's really starting to kick in because it takes about 15 minutes to really kick in the system. And then just drink my whole shake uh, during my whole workout pretty much at the end and then even maybe a little bit at the end on my way home. And then about an hour, an hour later after that, I would have another meal, um, it probably usually just with just rice and uh, some type of protein. Try to keep fats away from that time because you don't really want fats. Uh, at the time when the insulin there and then that pretty much covers that whole window and then after that you're pretty much you know you're pretty much free after that to eat what you want so i really like the the pre-workout insulin like that then you don't have to worry about anything after that and then later on like i said before bed i would just have a protein fat meal did you ever have any issues going hypoglycemic during your workouts uh, not really, to be honest. Um, I don't think I ever did. I, I always did keep sugar tabs, glucose tabs on me just in case, um, you know, you want to be smart about it when you're doing something like that. But, you know, so long as, you know, you're not, you know, being dumb or anything like that and you, and you keep that nearby just in case, honestly, I've never really ran into trouble over the last five years that I was, I was using it. So as long as you're, you know, smart about it and careful, then you shouldn't have really an issue. I, I agree with you on this one, Paulo. Like everyone talks about insulin and says like, oh, anyone using insulin has a death wish. There's over a million Americans self-administering insulin every day. I mean, if you're being smart about it and you're using a sensible dosage, you shouldn't have any problems. The only guys who run into issues are the guys using like 30, 40, 50 IUs. Exactly, yeah. So and, or, and, maybe, and maybe even people that, don't, you know, don't have something on hand, you know, with you that you should always have, you know, luckily I've never really needed to use it, but you should always have something nearby, some, you know, some sugar anyway. But yeah, I've never need to. I guess that's also to do with the low dosing, the 10 I use, you know, it's not really much anyway. So, but yeah, you're right. When you're getting up to those higher numbers, you got to be a little bit more careful. So what you said about fasting and trying to downsize, does that mean you're done with competing, Paulo? Yeah, I think I'm pretty much done with competing. Uh, to be honest, you know, at this point, it's not really worth it. Um, you know, there's, at my age, I have different priorities in life right now. And, uh, you know, I, I've done my thing. And, you know, last year was a bit, you know, I, hurt me a little bit. You know, I, it was weird because, you know, I did my first show in Toronto you know, I wasn't in the best shape. You know, I came in at a two, 270 pounds. You know, I was big and full and dry and it was freaky looking. And, 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 you know, I looked good. But then, you know, after that, I did, uh, you know, another show where I dropped 15 pounds literally in three weeks, got to the best shape of my life, got down to 255. You know, I had shredded glutes. I've never had that before. And I ended up getting, I think, ninth in that show. So, you know, it, it, it kind of rattles you. You know what I mean? It's like, then you think, you know, you're like, What's the point? You know what I mean? I, it doesn't make any sense. So at this point of my career, you know, I love competing and stuff, but honestly, it takes a lot out of you, you know, money-wise, health-wise, and uh, time away from loved ones. And, uh, you know, you just got to find if it's worth it or not. And at my age, you know, maybe if I was 32 or 22, sure. But being at 42, even though I do have a lot in the tank to give because I've only been training, you know, eight years, which is nothing for bodybuilding, my body's very fresh, feels fresh, looks fresh, and I still feel I haven't even come close to, Mac, uh, you know, bringing my best to date. But, you know, at this point, like I said, there's different priorities in life right now. And, you know, but there's more to life than bodybuilding. Paul, I appreciate you being so honest about that because a lot of young guys coming up into the sport, they seem to think that there's this pot of gold at the end of the pro card, right? They think like, oh, I'm going to turn pro, I'm going to get sponsors, I'm going to be driving six Lamborghinis, I'm going to have a six, uh, six car garage house. You don't get anything when you turn pro. Like, did, exactly, you have, exactly. you know, did you have a bunch exactly. of sponsors knocking on your door as soon as you turn pro? Yeah, yeah no, I actually, you know, I got my sponsor before I even turned pro, luckily, and he, it was actually a great sponsor. But yeah, you know, that's actually a huge thing that I'm trying to preach to these young guys nowadays. Cause that's all I see. These guys 
you know, they think that they're going to turn pro and their life's going to change. I'm sorry, but it doesn't change. You're the, still the same person. And that with nowadays, it's hard to even get sponsors of this, that. Like, it's just amazing. Like, it's great to have an ambition and this, that. But I just don't like seeing how these kids, all they do, that all they, everything, all their time they put into it is just trying to turn pro. Like, it's going to turn. It's not. You know, it might open a couple more doors, like via coaching and stuff like that. But it's not like how they think it is. I'm sorry. It's not going to be like that. Your life's not going to change crazy like that. Especially nowadays, they're handing out these pro cards like they're candy. So they don't even mean anything nowadays, to be honest, anyways. It's not even that hard to, get, to turn pro with the way they're giving them out nowadays, which is kind of sad as well, too. Everything's getting washed down. Being a pro doesn't really mean so much in, anymore, I find. And, yeah, these kids, you know, they put everything into this. And, you know, and it just seems like, you know, you're going to miss so much along the way. Oh, they can't be take, go on this trip or they can't go out and do this because they're dieting. And, you know, like I said, it's great to have an ambition and this, that, but don't make life all about that. You know, do, go to school, do your thing. Bodybuilding, I'm sorry, does not pay the bills. Unless you're maybe the top five in the world, you, you, you cannot survive on this. Even being an online coach, Paul, it's not, it's not all it seems to be. I mean, I, I'm an online coach. That's, yeah. that's what I make my living is training people. And, I'm literally sitting behind a computer answering emails 12 hours a day. Yeah, I bet. And, uh, you know, there are some guys that you can make a good living at it, but you know, it, it's just not for me. I just couldn't deal with it. I tried it. I didn't, I, I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with the repetitive of the emails and, and the, you know, the stupid questions and no offense to them, but it just, yeah, it just wasn't my thing. And especially nowadays too, everybody's a coach. Guys do one show, you know, and they're not going to pose it, and all of a sudden they're a coach now, and it's crazy. And then they're charging, you know, 50 bucks a month, and then, you know, all the good coaches, it's like, you know, they have to bring down their, their, their fee because the guy's going to go with the cheaper guy, which is obviously, the, obviously not the better guy to go with. So it's kind of sad now. That's what I see all over social media. Everybody's a coach. I'm like, really? Like, it's horrible. And what's also really scary, Paulo, is a lot of these coaches who don't know what they're doing, they're prescribing drug cycles that are ex- like way, way, way beyond what is necessary. Yep. Yep. It's, I mean, it's really sad actually. Paulo being, being, you know, competing at, you know, 255 to 270, what were some of the dosages you used so people can hear straight from the horse's mouth what one of the biggest IFBB pros takes? Um, well, I would uh, definitely not say that I was, you know, on the, I was definitely not on the extreme level and I was definitely not on the very little dosage, uh, like some people say as well. I was on a, a moderate dose, you know, maybe 750 tests to a gram a week, um, you know, and, and obviously, and during the off season was the main thing. I wasn't, I wasn't big on orals. I'm not a big believer of it because it kills your appetite and most of it's just all water retention anyways. And if you can't eat, then you're not able to put on real tissue growth. You need to eat to be able to put on real tissue growth. That water is not real tissue growth. So, you know, a lot of the orals, they make you sick. You can't eat. So what's the point? And it's all water weight anyways. So I wasn't ever a big a proponent of orals in the off season. And it was pretty much usually just test and another, you know, another anabolic like EQ or DECA or something like that. That's it. That's all you need. You don't need any more of that. Obviously, then... You know, when it, maybe like 400 uh, of DECA a week, you know, maybe 600 EQ a week alongside 750 tests, which, you know, might sound a lot to some, it might sound little to others. It all depends on what kind of scale you're on. But, you know, I've heard of double those doses just easy, if not triple. But, you know, and then when it comes to the competition time, then obviously you have to start throwing in all, all your other things, and, and that can really add up too. But it's more about synergy and using other, uh, uh, other, um, other other uh steroids as well and, and not so much of just one or the other and another thing that's really sad nowadays what i hear about is all this trend 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 these guys that are running trend in the off season i never ran trend in the off season there's no need for it you know if anything you might run that the last six weeks of your con- contest prep but other than that i see here and see these see here some people they're running it in their off season i even heard of one guy running it all year round i'm like what are you doing like, that's the worst thing for you, and it's not really going to do anything for you to grow. You know, it's not, you know, in the contest, sure, but use it as little as possible. I used to hate running that kind of stuff. It was the worst, aside from it, because it was very effective, but it's not meant to be running all year round. It's not good for your health, and it's just, there's just no need for it. 
what's really scary about trend is that trend balloon usage is actually directly linked to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So, I mean, if you're using it for a short 10 week pre-contest cycle, you're probably not going to run into issues, but if you're using it year round, like you're just asking for trouble. Of course. And like I said, like all, what I hear, like all these kids, that's what they're doing on the off season. I'm like, really? I'm like, I can't believe that. Why? How? How are you functioning? Like, I don't even like the feeling I got off it. Sure, your body changes on it, but like it, it's, it's for a certain reason. Like you said, six to eight weeks, maybe your last of your prep, not during the, the rest of the season. It's so bad for you. It's one of the worst on your kidneys and everything that. Like, people don't realize you got to worry about your health. It's like, I tell, like, I, like I was saying, I always tell people, there's no point looking good on the outside if you can't look good on the inside. You know what I mean? And, and it's pretty sad. And the, a lot of these guys, and that's another thing too, you know, a lot of these guys, they're not staying on top of their health. They're not staying on top of their blood work. And you've been hearing a lot about it lately about more a lot of people. You know, even friends, I, even friends I know I have, they have, I have kidney issues. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, wh- check your blood pressure. It's the number one thing you should be checking. It's a freaking $50 monitor. Go buy one. Check yourself twice a week. You know what I mean? Simple. That'll prevent you from so many things, you know, instead of ending up in the hospital. These guys, everybody, all these kids and all these guys are spending all this money on all this growth hormone and all the, all the, all the steroids and stuff, but they won't spend $50 on, on a freaking uh, blood pressure monitor. The number one thing that you should be monitoring, watching out for, so your kidneys don't fail. Like, I, I, it baffles me. I don't get it. Or, or, or they won't talk to, your, to their doctor and be straight up and tell them what they're doing. You have to. You have to tell your doctor what you're doing be straight up. He's not going to condone it. He's not going to agree with what you're doing, but he still has to watch over your health if he's a cool doctor. And if he's not, you find a doctor that is. I love that you said that, Paulo. Um, if you go to your doctor and you tell them that you're using steroids, they're going to do their due, due diligence, you know, give you a five-minute lecture about the dangers and things like that. But as your healthcare provider, he is responsible for keeping you healthy. So he's going to make sure you're getting blood work done. Um, if things are out of range, he's going to prescribe you cholesterol medications, blood pressure medications. Even some doctors will prescribe, you know, a, remis, uh, a remisin, a Rimidex, a rheumatize inhibitors. Um, it's in your best interest to tell your doctor using steroids. It's not like he can go tell a bunch of people. He has to sign a non-disclosure act. Exactly. And like I, 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 from the day one, I've always, I've been straight up with my doctor and yeah, they are going to give you that lecture right away. But after that, you know what, he's going to appreciate you for coming up open and wanting to be on top of your health. And that's how he should be because you, you know, and that, and the amount of money I've spent on blood work because they will only write up so many requisites for you to get tested. He can't get you to test all everything all the, all the time because you know, or else, you know, the medical services plan will be like, hey, why do you keep sending this guy for this, that? He'll send you for the basic stuff. But if you want other stuff to get checked, you have to pay for it. And I paid out of my own pocket thousands just to get things checked, just to make sure I know what's going on in my body. But you have to be straight up with your doctor and tell him, look, this is what I'm doing. I want to be on top of my health. I know it's not the best thing to do, but I'm going to do regardless. Can you, you know, help me, you know, watch over me and send me for tests? And, you know, what if I have to pay for them, then pay for them, whatever. That's, you know... Do what you got to do. It's your health. You know, you only got one, one health. You only got one life, man. You know, and like I, like I tell people, that, you know, there's not necessarily a healthy way to do this sport, but there is a way that we can do it where it's less unhealthy, if you know what I mean. 100%, Paulo. So, Paulo, it sounds like you're doing it's everything fun. right. Um, I'm sure our listeners would love to know, do you take any sort of health supplements? Are you doing any sort of um, infrared saunas, um, massage, chiropractic. Give us kind of like your weekly keeping healthy checklist. Well, I'm, I'm huge on health, and I have been, especially over the last couple of years. You know, I've been following a lot of people that are reputable in the sport, the John Meadows, the Dante Trudeau, the people that really know about this stuff have been there, know the science, and, and, and everything's proven. So I've been following them, and I've been le- learning. I've been listening. I listen to podcasts every day to try to learn more from all these reputable people that know about all this kind of stuff. So I'm definitely on top of my head, uh, on top of my health, sorry. Um, and that's why I got into this whole fasting thing, too, because there's a lot of health properties to do with it as well. But, I've, yeah, I've been on to my health for the last little while. You know, I, I take my the main things, you know, my cucumin, I take my fish oil, my krill oil, 
you know, I take citrus bergamot, which is really good for your cholesterol, uh, things like that. Um, I take my, uh, my flaxseed, which is really good for your cholesterol, all those kind of things, you know, and then your basics, your vitamin C, your vitamin D, which is huge, crucial, which everybody should be on. Number one deficient hormone that, that we don't have, vitamin or, which is actually a hormone that people don't have enough of, which is responsible for so many processes in the body. Um, other than that, uh, massage and all that, I would love to go for more if I could, but you know, that stuff's not cheap. It really adds up. Um, but I did spend the money in a very good massage chair. So I do that every once in a while while I can. Uh, hot tub, uh, hot tub and sauna. The sauna is very good for you health wise, as I'm sure you probably know as well. And uh, more people should know, but it's very, very helpful. It actually even increases your natural GH growth hormone, uh, uh production. But it has other health benefits as well. It's very good to do that at least once or twice a week. Um, but yeah, other than that, that's pretty much it. Uh, and other than that, yeah, just, uh, just I make sure just get, get in my supplements. And that's a big thing I try to uh, tell these kids too, and, or even friends that are my age that don't even know about this. Those health supplements and diet, that can really go a long way in what we're doing to make it less unhealthy. It's huge. That's what they're there for. And they're proven. They're science proven. So, you know, spend the money into those in supplements. You know, I have a, a stack of 10 things I take every day, almost twice a day, and I'm on top of it. And, you know, I got the blood work to, to prove it. That, that, that shows pretty, it's pretty damn good for someone who's been doing this for a little while now. One supplement that I recommend all steroid users take is collagen because steroids decrease collagen synthesis in the body. And when people think collagen, they think joints, ligaments, connective tissue, but your entire cardiovascular system is made out of collagen. And that's the reason why pretty much every steroid user ends up dying of some sort of cardiovascular disease. So I definitely add that to your list, Paulo. Yeah, exactly. And I have, I have taken that before and I'm, I'll probably get back into that again. And another one I want to mention too, which is huge, is astragalus, which has been proven to repair kidneys and is great for kidney function, which all bodybuilders is probably one of the number one things we have to watch out for because what we do, it puts a lot of stress on our kidneys. And it's not like the liver, which is resilient. The liver can take a beating and come back and, and regenerate. The kidneys, once you're done, that's it. it. It's over, you're done. And that's one thing that you really want, have to watch out for. So astragalus, which I got from, you know, listening from Dante Trudell, has been proven, has the science behind it. Every bodybuilder should be taking that one gram uh, twice a day, and that'll help re rejuvenate the kidneys uh, and keep everything flowing really good. And we should all be doing that. And but not, number one is stay on top of your blood pressure. You got people have to watch that. I'm uh, I'm amazed. I can't. I'm baffled of how many people do not monitor their blood pressure. That's where you get all your problems from, pretty much. From the kidneys, people think it's meat and uh, or red meat and this that. Watch, you got to watch your blood pressure. Honestly, I've been watching it ever since I started. Yeah, I agree with you. And then also, just following a sensible diet. I mean, if you're eating nothing but chicken and rice for six meals a day, like that's a nutrient deficiency waiting to happen. Like, eat some vegetables, especially dark yeah. green vegetables like kale. Oh yeah, they're huge for you, man. Even like broccoli sprouts and stuff like that. Then. There's so many of the cruciferous uh, vegetables. They're so good for you. Make sure you're getting your fiber and uh, keep everything come, you know, going through. And, you know, you got to stay on top of that. It's amazing. Uh, people just, like I say, like I always say, you know, there's no point looking good on the outside if you can't look good on the inside. Honestly, what for? So, Paulo, one thing I'm really curious about, and one thing I'm sure our listeners are probably very curious about, is that you're sponsored by 5% Nutrition, Rich Piana's former line. Has anything changed with the company after Rich Piana passed away? Um, yeah, actually, a lot of things have changed, to be honest. And, you know, there was obviously some changes that needed to be made after we lost Rich. And, you know, Rich was a huge inspiration to me. He was like a big brother to me. So losing him was, was a pretty big impact. And, you know, that's another thing to really make your eyes open, too, after we lost him and we lost Dallas McCarver. You know, that should make people wake up and, and realize, you know, what's going on here. You know, we can still do the sport in a healthy way. We got to just be on top of things and watch ourselves. But that's an eye opener for people. But other than that, yeah, I've been sponsored with five percent. They they're definitely going through their changes. 
you know, they've had Martin Ford try to kind of step up to try to replace Rich, was obviously nobody can. Nobody can ever replace Rich. I don't think there'll ever be another Rich in the fitness industry. But um, other than that, yeah, there's definitely been some changes along the way. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Interesting. It seems that they're pretty good for you, though, so I'm guessing you'll probably stick with them for a while. Um, yeah, they've, they've been really good, for, good to me, especially when, when Rich was around. Uh, Rich was awesome to me and, and, you know, anything I needed, he was there for me and big supporter of mine. And, you know, especially when I came forth in Toronto uh, two years ago, you know, he was there watching me, which was awesome, big, huge, proud moment. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he, he's been so supportive of me. He picked me up before I even turned pro, but he knew that I, he, he knew what he saw. He knew that I had it in me. And uh, right when he seen me, he's like, yeah, bring him. I want him. I want him on my team. And ever since then, it's been great. And we just had that great bond. And like I said, he's been a big brother to me. And I've, he's given me a lot of advice, you know, through not only training, but life advice and career wise and stuff like that. So it, it was such a, a great uh, time. It, it was a great time to have him in my life. I'm glad I got to meet him and I'm glad, glad that he was in my life for that time that he was. I've never met Rich, but I'm good friends with Ron Partlow and Ron had nothing but super positive things to say about him. Yeah, Ron's another great guy as well. And uh, yeah, Rich, he was huge. Like um, um, the, the thing that was amazing about him is he would give, it doesn't matter who you were, he would give you as much time as you want. Like when you're at expos, that's just the thing that still amazes me to this day. Even if we were just walking on the street and somebody would just walk up to him and want a picture, just a, a nobody, just a bum or whatever, no problem, no questions asked, boom, no problem. You know, when you, but a lot of these other guys, you won't see that with a lot of other top pros. There's no way. But that's, that's who he was. And that's why he had the huge, he, the biggest following there was in the fitness industry. There was nobody else like him in the fitness industry. I'll tell you that right now. Nobody else had two hour lineups. And all you know, and just to take a picture with them, you know, people had the other li- big lines in their booths and stuff. But that was because people were waiting for free product. At his line, there was nothing free. The only thing you got free was a picture. And it was still amazing to this day how people would wait two, uh, literally two hours, just to just to take a picture with them. It was it was amazing, it, what to see that. Do you have any favorite stories with Rich that you'd want to share to our listeners? Um, <laughs> not off the top of my head, but. But uh, we just had great times. That, that was the best part of the, about the Expos, honestly. It wasn't even the Expos itself because, you know, he was doing his thing. I was doing my thing. It was looking forward to the after the Expo. You know, we'd go train. We'd go have dinner. And he, he was such a funny guy. And, and it, 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 uh, he made us laugh so much. But, yeah, honestly, off the top of my head, I, I just can't think of any right now. Knowing his work ethic, I'm guessing, was he a really hard trainer? Uh, yeah, he was, he was a really hard trainer, but he was also more of a perfectionist as well, too. And, uh, you know, that was the thing, though, too, is like when we did hook up, it wasn't about him because he, he was always doing like filming and training and doing stuff when he was in his own. But when it came to the expos, you know, that's the opportunity to, to take care of his that, to, to focus on his athletes because his athletes weren't always around to film and stuff. So every time I would be, go to the expos, the main focus would be on me or maybe some of the other top athletes for 5%. And so it wasn't really on him. He would be too more behind the scenes, uh, you know, filming or, or, or making sure the guy who the videographer was getting the best angles and stuff like that too. So it'd be hard to see, you know, how he was training and stuff like that too, because he'd be too focused on us taking advantage of that time that we were there because we didn't see him all the time. So He'd always want to make sure we, he was getting as much foot as he can when we were going to these expos and stuff. What about going to going out to eat after? Was he a big eater? Um, no, no, not he used to be honest. He, he was never a big eater. Surprisingly, I guess he probably is like me. He grows on a little little food, but uh, yeah, when we were going out, no, he wasn't. He wasn't really that big of an eater. One thing I've always found surprising is that it's the really big guys, the guys like you and Rich, they don't actually don't eat that much. It's more the skinnier guys, like the guys who are like 210, 220. Those are the ones who need like 7,000 calories to grow. I know. It's pretty funny like that. But I guess that's just the way it is because I guess they need that because their metabolism, I guess, is just so fast. 
that's why, you know, when people used to always ask me, oh, what do you take or what do you eat? Or, you know, I always, and I always told people, I said, it doesn't matter. You can take double what I take or eat double what I eat. It does, it, we're different people. You know, you're not going to look like me. That's why genetics, I always preach that in all my posts and I always preach that to everybody. Genetics, genetics, genetics. It's a huge part in this, in this sport. Cause I've known guys that have been training 15, 20 years. You know, and I came along, boom, after a couple of years, I was like already, you know, basically turning pro. It's like, you know, I kind of felt bad because these guys have been going really hard for like 15, 20 years. I and mean, here I come along three years later, boom, I'm pretty much turning pro. It's like, you know, yeah, hard work, but, you know, it's also genetics. You too. One analogy I love to use, Paulo, is that if you're a poodle, I can train you to be the biggest and most badass poodle possible, but I can't convert you into a pit bull. Exactly. And that's what I always, and that's what I always preach to people when I'm making my posts as well. You know, you might, you might, you know, all you can do, all you can control is do, be the best you can, work as hard as you can, and that's it. Wherever, wherever the life takes you, that's, you know, don't be, don't be disappointed because, you know, after a certain point, that's where genetics kick in. But the one thing you can control is just working your ass off, doing the best you can, just being the best you. Other than that, you know, if you can't be a professional basketball player or soccer player or bodybuilder, then so be it. But don't be down about it. Just as long as you know you give it your all, that's, that's all you can do. And you can be proud of that. 100%, Paul. Like myself, for example, I'm the biggest bodybuilding fan. Like I look at, you know, you, Rich, Ron Partlow. I love it. But I'm a tall guy. I got long limbs. I got a small frame. I won my pro card in physique and I competed in physique because I just had to deal with the hands I was dealt. I'm never going to carry as much muscle as you. It doesn't matter what drugs I take. It doesn't matter how much I eat. I just don't have the genetic blueprint for it. But I have a tight waist. I'm, you know, I look really, really good. I have a very good, you know, fitness model type physique. So that's the, the cards I was dealt and that's the hand I had to play. Exactly. And that's what people have to realize. And that's another thing I want to touch on too, is I'm a, that's why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of now of the, the new classic division, the, because that gives the people that are kind of stuck in between, they're a little bit too big for physique, but a little bit too small structurally or not, you know, genetically for bodybuilding. So I really love that category. And I, I believe that category is going to be taking over the open class pretty quick here because it, it's more people can relate to that and fit in that, 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 that class. Not everybody can be 260 on stage freaks. You know what I mean? Or whatever, 250, you know, that's just not the way it is. So, you know, find what works for you and go with it and then just be the best you can in that, in there. I agree with you completely, Paula. So talking a little bit about Rich Piana, who's the godfather of social media, what are your thoughts on social media? Uh, you know, it, it's helped a lot, but it's also hurt a lot too. And, you know, the more and more I look at it nowadays, it, it's getting pretty sad out there. Honestly, it's just a bunch of, it, it's just girls with their booty shots and posting their booties and, and, you know, and, and it, it's pretty bad, honestly. And the stuff I've been seeing on there, it's just, it's getting worse and worse. There's like, there's nothing really informative. There's nothing really good to watch on there. It's just pretty much half naked women, mostly all over the place. And, and, and just, it's and guys who don't know how to train, trying to be coaches and, you know, so it's helped people. Yeah, sure. It's helped people a lot, but I think it's hurt a lot too. And to be honest, to be honest with you, Trevor, you know, I'm counting down the days that, you know, I'm going to be off social media and I can't wait. Uh, that's just not made for me. I'm not, I'm not into it. I only got into it because I had to, you know, get into it for my career wise. And, you know, it was the thing you had to, you had to pretty much do it. Now, it is the thing nowadays, but I'm getting into you know, a different type of business where I don't need to be on there anymore. And I, I can't, I can't wait for the day I'm not, but unfortunately right now, you know, I still have a sponsorship. I am kind of still marketing myself on there as well, using it as a tool, but I am counting down that days that I uh, will be off there and I won't have to see all that and be on there. And, you know, it's pretty sad. You know, I, I, I did like posting stuff on there and, and getting the, you know, comments, oh, you motivate me. I, I love that aspect of it. It was great. I love motivating people. I love getting that feedback. But just all, all the other stuff you see on there, it's just, I don't know, it's pretty bad. So for me, social media has its pluses and negatives. Like, I love getting emails, you know, from someone in like Australia saying like, hey man, I just listened to your podcast. I love the episode. 
Um, I didn't know about this, 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 this. Thanks for sharing. Like for me, that's really cool that I can, you know, reach people in Denmark or Germany, Australia. But what upsets me is that what got me into bodybuilding is I just love to train. You know, I remember just being a very, like I started actually as an overweight 13 year old and just being like really upset with my body and just going to the YMCA and just, and just working and working and working and working and slowly changing my body and just getting that satisfaction of just like hard training. But when I go into the gym today, it seems like people are more interested in taking selfies and seeing how many likes their selfie gets and actually training. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's kind of one thing I don't, I don't like doing either because that's always been my thing too. I love training. And then, but unfortunately, you know, with social media, you kind of, kind of got to do that. You got to throw in your clips of training and this stuff. But what I do is, you know, I'll, I'll throw, I'll, I'll take myself doing a quick set and the, you know, the phone gets put right away in my pocket. I don't sit there and looking at this, that, because I don't want to slow down my intensity. And that's the only thing, you know, the bad thing about it, but, you know, and you're right. That's all it is. Selfies is selfies that it's sad. You know, these people aren't even in there to train. They're just in there to look good. And, you know, I don't get it. I, well, another thing I don't get, honestly, is what's with all this filtering and all this kind of stuff, too, and, and Photoshopping. Like, really? Like, I don't, I don't understand the point of that. Like, you're just, you're just making it worse for yourself. You're, making, you're, you're giving yourself a picture of who you are, but that's not really you. And I, I've never understood that. Like, all this filtering and Photoshopping just to make yourself picture look good. Like, show, show your real self. That's what it's all about. It makes no sense to me. I, I hate that. It would almost be like using fake pictures on a dating profile and then like going to on a first date with that person. They're not going to go on a second date with you because you didn't post real photos. So yeah, it, it never made sense to me either, Paul. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, just show who you really are. You look like, why you got to show your enhanced? Like, it's, it's the funniest thing. I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. But I don't know, whatever. Teach their own, I guess, but... So, Paul, we've got about five minutes left. One thing I'm curious to hear about is what is your plan to downsize? So you said a little bit about intermittent fasting. Emphasize that a little bit more and explain, you know, kind of what you're doing just to get your health back, downsize a little bit. And then what are your long-term plans with all of this? Well, the, um, I'm fasting. So I'm fasting about 16 hours a day. I'm having only like three meals a day. And this is totally opposite of like how it was when I was full, full into the bodybuilder lifestyle, having, you know, six meals a day and this, that. But the thing is, it's pretty crazy. I'm having a hard time actually losing the weight, even with implementing the cardio, with the fasting. You know, my protein slashed in half, if not less. I'd probably taken about 450 grams of protein before. I'm probably at maybe about 200 now. And I'm amazed. And what, but what I think has made me hold on to the size so easy was my, my training. You know, I've trained always hard, as most people know who have trained with me or seen me train. You know, I train hard. I've, I've built that foundation. And so, you know, it's going to come easy and it's not going to go away that, that, that easy. Like a lot of these people say, they say they lose their size, they shrink and this, that. You know, that's why I'm such a huge proponent of training. Training is number training intensity to me is number one. I think it even overrules nutrition, overrules training form, it, train, it overrules everything. If you're not pushing yourself in the gym, you are not going to create that simulation for muscles to grow. I don't care what anybody says. You know, and that's one thing that's always been there from the day one when I got into training. Training intensity. I train. I push myself. I'm going to failure every time, pretty much every set. And I'm always trying to beat the previous, the, my previous day of pushing weights. Obviously, it's going to slow down to a point, but I'm always pushing myself. Push, push, push. My form has never been the greatest. My diet has never been the greatest. It was horrible for the first couple of years. I was having just like protein on its own shakes, which is obviously horrible. So basically, I was just using that for fuel. You know, only over the last four or five years where my form and my nutrition has gotten better. And, but the one thing that's always been there from day one is intensity. And I don't see that enough in the gym. And then people why, wonder why they're not getting the, you know, the hashtag gains that, that they want because they're not pushing themselves in the gym. I see them in the gym. I'm like, really? Like, they're just like, uh, da, 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 like, like it's nothing. They, I think they go to the gym just so they can say they went to the gym. But I was asking, but did you actually train? You know, there's a difference, you know, going to the gym and training or going to the gym so, just so you can say you went to the gym. So that, you know, the, the, my training, found the, my foundation has really helped me keep the size. 
So basically, sorry, we'll go off topic there, but yeah. So I'm implementing the six hour fast. I'm having only three meals a day, you know, which is down from six. My protein is slashed in half and I'm still having a hard time dropping the weight. Um, I, I guess I shouldn't necessarily say I want to just drop weight. It should be more dropping fat. And I have been, but it's definitely not easy uh, with, you know, even implementing the cardio and with all these things I'm, I'm doing, you know, my weight's still hovering around 290, which is, you know, and, and it's crazy. And I want to try to drop down because, you know, not being a competitive bodybuilder no more, there's no point being so big. But to be honest, at this weight, I do feel comfortable. So there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I'm not, you know, hopping up, puffing, going upstairs. I'm pretty, I'm pretty flexible. Uh, you know, this weight is a good ideal weight for me. I think I just held this weight for so many years that it's hard. For, you know, my body's come accustomed to it. That it's going to be hard for me to drop down. I really think I need to starve myself uh, to, uh, to drop more weight. If you build your physique on hard training, that's hard, dense muscle that's not going anywhere. If you build your physique on drugs, that'll go away super easy. So that's why you're not losing the muscle, man. Exactly. Like, you know, like, you know, for a prime example, you, know, you see Brad Warren, you know, he's got one of the worst, I think, training, training techniques there is. But if you see his intensity, it's crazy. And like I said, if you're just, if you're training, uh, your training's intense, you know, you're going to create that stimulation. You're going to build muscle tissue. You know, if you're taking all these drugs, yeah, it's all water, this, that, you know what I mean? So that, that I, you know, I, you know, I got injured in September. I was able to hold and maintain a lot of my size and I came back to normal. I feel like I've never even left anywhere. My legs, for example, I haven't, I've trained them maybe six times in the last maybe eight, nine months since I got injured and they've barely downsized. It's crazy. It's, it's, I, I'm actually shocked because I actually did want them to downsize so I could start fitting in normal pants and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I got to even train them just so they can downsize. But honestly, they're barely even, getting smaller. But I, I, like I said, I credit that to years and years of pounding them with the weight. You know, you're going to build that foundation. It, it's, you know, it's there. You know, someone was telling me after they got injured, they had the same injury I did. They said after one week that their cast got so loose that they had to go back in and get another cast put on. And I'm thinking to myself, really? I've had this cast on for, I think it was what, four weeks or something like that, six weeks, and it barely downsized at all. So the only conclusion I can come up with is obviously that guy must have been taking something just to create, have so much water weight that when he got injured, that the, his arm shrank so much from it just being water weight that he had to go in and get another cast put on. You know, that's a prime example right there. I didn't need to go in there and do that because obviously I had already built the foundation and it wasn't all water. Of course, there's some, but, you know, there's to a certain degree. Like you said, if you build that heart the foundation over years and years, you're not going to shrink. Yeah, you'll downsize a little bit because you're not, you know, holding that much volume and, or glycogen anymore from not training. But there's no way you should, like, shrink to nothing. So, Paulo, to finish off the show, let our listeners know how you get fired up for a workout. I mean, I've seen some of your videos of you train. I mean, you train balls to the wall. Like, you train all out. Do you, do you have, like, maybe, like, a pre-workout ritual is there certain music that gets you fired up? Do you use any sort of like visualization? What gets you fired up to train with the intensity you do? Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I, honestly, I just, I love working out. I love going in there. I love pushing weight around and I just find my own motivation to be honest. Yeah. I, I like music and I like listening to music and stuff like that. Sometimes rock, sometimes house, something, usually something upbeat, even rap. It doesn't matter, but I just find my own motivation. I just want to, I just love the feeling. I love getting the blood flowing. I love pushing heavy weight around. And I just find, I just find my own motivation. And I, I look at each time I'm in there basically. And I think it, everybody should look at this is a way to progress, a way to get better. I look at it as I'm going to the workout. I'm going to come out of there better. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to push as much weight and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to respond from it. And I'm going to be bigger and I'm going to be better from that workout. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to kill it. And I'm going to give everything I have. And I'm going to leave there knowing that I couldn't do anymore. And that, that's, that's basically the way I look at it. And that's, that's my motivation. You, get, you know, I look at it as I'm going in there to train. That's going to give me another session to get better. And I want to, that's why I always tell people, you got to take advantage of each session you do. There's not that many in the year, honestly. So you got to take advantage. Every session, every set, every rep. Make it all count. 
because as long as you do that, then, then whatever the future holds, it, it, it doesn't matter. As long as you did your best, that's all that matters. But I tell you right now, there's a huge percentage of people that can't walk out of the gym knowing that, saying that. There's no way that they could, they're saying, oh, I gave it all my all or I, I couldn't do anymore. There's no way. Because honestly, everybody should be getting the same results. And like I always tell people, you know, even when I was training clients before, whether you're 17 or you're 70, I don't care. You still need to push yourself. Obviously, you're not going to be lifting the same kind of weights or this, that, but you still need to push yourself. If you're going to be in the gym, why are you going to be in there for? We're in there to get better, aren't we? So why not, you know, you got to push yourself. Like I said, I don't care if you're 17 or you're 70. If you're going to go to the gym, you, you're in there for a reason to get benefits out of it. You have to push yourself. Like it's basic. Like I tell people, you get out what you put in. You put in 50%, you're going to get out 50%. You put in 100%, you're going to get out 100%. Plain and simple. Great advice, Paulo. One, one thing I like to do and one thing I highly recommend is getting a training log, writing down your workouts, and then trying to beat them every workout. And one thing I do myself is that let's say I squatted 200 pounds for 20 reps and I'm looking at that and I'm like, holy smokes, I have to do 205 for 20 reps. Like this is going to be brutal. Like I don't even know how I'm going to do it. Before I start that set, I tell myself, am I going to spend the rest of the day knowing I didn't get all 20 reps? I say that to myself like five times and then I unrack the weight. And somehow I always manage to do the 20 reps. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's a great tool um, to me, to be honest. I've never used that as a tool. Um, in my head, I already know what I, I already know how many reps I did the week, the, 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 the session before. So I know what I need to get. The only kind of thing I don't like about the logbook is, is for example, you have a bad day and all of a sudden you don't get the same reps you did the, the, the session before. Well, now it's going to kind of play mentally with your head. You're going to be like, oh, my God, I'm losing strength or this, that. Because we all have bad days. You know, there's been days where I feel like strong as a health. And there's days that I feel like, you know, I, I don't feel that strong. I feel like everything's heavy. So that's the only kind of thing I don't like about the logbook. You know, if mentally you can have your own logbook in your head like I do. I guess a lot of people can't, so they do need it, which, like I said, it, it, it is a great tool. But like I said, it could work against you because, like I said, you know, you did a certain amount of reps for that time before you go in there. All of a sudden, you did one less rep. Now it's kind of playing with your head. Oh, man, I'm getting weaker, blah, blah, blah. No, you could have just had a bad day. You know, the, my, my logbook, it's in my head. I know what I did. I know what I did with the weight the session before. You should be able to remember what you did. So I know I'm going to go in there, and that's what I'm going to get, or that's what I'm going to be. So I don't need to put that down. But yeah, you're right. It could be a great tool for certain people. Not everybody needs it. Like I said, for myself, I've just always, it's always been in my head. I just push whatever the weight, the weight I know I'm going to be pushing. I push as many times as I can. That's it. I honestly, I don't even almost even count reps. I know roughly what rep range I'm in. I push myself till I go, till I go to failure. That's one thing that I was done. And that's, you know, some people, they, they say going to failure every time is not good. It's not good for your CNS, but that's the only way I've known how. And you know what? If it ain't broke, why fix it? That's the, I think that's been a huge reason why I've grown so fast. I push myself. Every set to me is failure. I push till I can't push no more. And like I said, some people say it's not a good thing to do. That's the only way of knowing how. Hey, it's worked for me. You know what I mean? So if it ain't broke, like I said, why fix it? Have you ever seen a really jacked guy say don't train to failure? Yeah, but probably not really, I guess. <laughs> there are, but I have heard people say, you know, going to failure all the time is not good for your system, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it, I don't know. Like I said, maybe he's right. Maybe they are. But to me, that's the only way I've known. I, I, I can't. I can't stop shy of one or two reps. I'm sorry. I just can't hold back. And I think that's why, like I said, that's a big reason why I grew so fast. You know, I got to 300 pounds in literally like five years. That's, that's crazy. I'm in good condition, not a slob. And like I said, I owe that all to, to, to training hard, training intensity, always pushing, always wanting to lift more than the previous session. And that's how I grew so fast. There, there is some truth that to training to failure is very hard on your central nervous system, but that's why you take rest days. Exactly. That's why if you implement rest days on certain times, for me, I've always had a rest day after leg day. I, I don't see how people can go and get a proper session in after a crazy ass leg session. I'm barely walking out of there in a wheelchair after a leg session. So how can somebody go train back or even chest or something the next day after a leg session? There's no way. 
You, that's why I've always had a rest day after leg day, the most intense day of the week. Not because physically, but the central nervous system, like you said, it needs a break. And then that's when I'd probably go implement some hot, some, some sauna or something like that to really de-stress. You know, so if you if you have those days implemented every so often, and even you know what I'd like to do every so often, maybe after maybe two months or this that, you know, I'll take two days off in a row just to you know give the body a break. You know, and then and then that's if you just implement things like that, you're good to go all the time. And as long as your nutrition and your rest is there, and like I said, those rest days are properly timed, you're good to go. Although I appreciate you doing this interview, and I appreciate you being so upfront and honest with everything. Of course, man. That's the only way I know how, and that's the way I always, always will be. There's no point in, in sugarcoating nothing. You know, I want to be honest. I want to help as many people out there as possible, and that's the only way to, there is. And we need to be all more open about this. There is nothing to hide. We have to be more open about everything and drug use and everything like that because that's the way it is. Knowledge is power. You know, and that's the way I've learned over the years from listening to other people uh, older than me that have the experience, and that's how you're supposed to learn. For your host, Trevor Kuritsen, and for my special guest, Paulo the Freak Almeida, this has been another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life, look good doing it. Thanks for listening. Thank mm-hmm. you.